Hello, everybody. Um, my name's Claire. I'm from the XR UK media and messaging team. Um, you may have seen that the IPCC report came out at the beginning of last week. Um, it's been uh, widely regarded as the most important report ever so far from them, and yet it's had almost no coverage. So I've invited Charlie Gardner from XR Scientists to come and have a conversation about it. So. Welcome, Charlie. Thanks for coming. First question, super basic. What is the IPCC report? So as you say, this is hugely important because it brings together all the science that's been produced over the last few years. So the United Nations have brought together this team of scientists, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, and they've just summarized absolutely everything we know about the climate into these three reports. One was about just the climate science that came out a few months ago. This one is about how we can adapt to it. And in a few months, there'll be the final one, which is about um, what we can do to reduce it and stop it happening in the first place. The purpose of this is to try and have a bit of a translation job, right? So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to run through some of the stuff that's in this, the summary for policymakers. The report itself is enormous. And then you have this much more concise summary, which is signed off by all the governments, right? So when we launched XR, we used to say the IPCC was kind of a space where you find science dancing with politics. Do you want to explain what the summary for policymakers is? Yeah, so as you say, the, the reports themselves are absolutely huge. And of course, media and governments don't have time to read that. So they produce this, this synthesized, this short version. The problem is that while the main reports are agreed only by the scientists, the summary for policymakers are political documents. They're agreed by, by the negotiators of the countries that are, are party to the convention. But the main takeaways for me from this report are things like um, it's happening now, it's worse than we thought, it's a big focus on loss and damage, which I think is really important, and that we're almost out of time. So I've never read anything so stark. It does show just how much we know, just yeah. how much incredible science has been you know, carried out and how, how much information we have about what's coming. Yeah. So it's not that we're unprepared. Yeah. I'm going to read out some statements as they appear in the report. And then you can tell me what does it really mean. <laughs> the rise in weather and climate extremes has led to some irreversible impacts as natural and human systems are pushed beyond their ability to adapt. So what that means is we've already fucked our climate so badly that we're creating such extreme weather that some parts of the natural world just can't cope with it and some parts of our own human systems can't cope with it. And some of the damage we've already done is going to be completely irreversible. We cannot undo it now. It's a horrible start, isn't it? Um, OK, next one. Climate change has caused substantial damages and increasingly irreversible losses in terrestrial, freshwater and coastal and open ocean marine ecosystems. The extent and magnitude of climate change impacts are larger than estimated in previous assessments. Shifts in seasonal timing have occurred due to climate change and hundreds of local losses of species have been driven by increases in the magnitude of heat extremes, as well as mass mortality events on the land and in the ocean. Right, now that was a complex one. Basically, it's saying that wherever we look at life on Earth, we're seeing that it has been massively impacted by climate change already. Animals and plants are disappearing because of the changes in our climate. Last year, we reached almost 50 degrees in Canada, which is just mind-blowing. You know, 50 degrees in Canada, and the ocean got so hot that marine life, fish and you know, oysters and mussels and things, they were literally boiled to death. It was estimated that one billion uh, individual animals were, died in that event. And that's just one event that happened in one place in the world, and yet a billion animals were boiled to death. And there was an estimate of a billion animals lost in the wildfire season that was terrible in Australia recently, right? So it's hard to imagine what a billion animals is, but anyway, that's enormous. Next section, climate change has adversely affected physical health of people globally and mental health of people in assessed regions. Mental health challenges are associated with increasing temperatures, trauma from weather and climate extreme events, and loss of livelihoods, 
and culture. So there's quite a lot of different impacts they're talking about here. They talk, yeah, they, they mentioned physical health, and of course we know that when it gets far too hot, yeah, people die in heat waves, people get lung disease from being near wildfires and inhaling smoke. So we know about the physical um, effects on, on health. What's becoming more apparent recently, and what this report is the first to really highlight, is the impacts on our mental health. And we hear about this a lot in our societies, in, in, in our industrialized societies. We hear about young people suffer for, suffering from anxiety and fear for the future. And of course, this is a completely normal and rational reaction to hear that you have no future, to hear that our planet is as fucked as it is. When you hear that for the first time, of course that's going to be really distressing and make you anxious. But this report highlights that it's not just people in our societies having this anxiety, but people on the front lines in tropical countries and low-income countries that are suffering from, from severe climate impacts are really suffering. You know, when you have your home destroyed, that's traumatic and it leads to mental health impacts. And it talks there about the loss of livelihoods and the loss of culture. You know, climate change is going to be so bad, as the report talks about later, that people aren't going to be able to live in the places they live now. Entire groups of people are going to have to abandon their homelands, and that means abandoning their identity. Their whole sense of being is tied into where they live. Think about people from Pacific Islands, from, from Tuvalu and low-lying Pacific Islands. If your entire country doesn't even exist anymore, it, it's unimaginable. I, I, I just don't know what that would do to my mental health. If my country disappeared. The failure to do what's right on this issue is going to destroy entire countries. And it's not like we haven't known. The science has been out there for four decades. Our leaders have known. The IPCC that published this report was set up in 1992. I was 12 years old when they started, and yet we still haven't stopped burning fossil fuels now. We're still doing it faster than, than, than ever. Failure isn't even the word. It's, it's unimaginable how badly the world has reacted to, to, to this emergency that we've known about. And this report is the first one, I feel, that has made its as clear as, as this on historic patterns of inequity such as colonialism and recognition of like the fact that money's not flowing right where it should be going from rich countries to poor countries. It's so important that we acknowledge this and, and that this is written down finally in papers like this. You know, we talk about we have caused climate change, humanity has done it, but that's not true. It's you know, the rich countries that industrialize first have done it, and the richest people within those societies have been um, emitting far more than, than, than everyone else. There's this big imbalance in who's caused the problem, but there's also a big imbalance in who's paying the cost. It's not us that are suffering, it's people in low-income countries that were, who are suffering more extreme events and who are less capable of, of dealing with it because they don't have you know, the infrastructure and things. So the people who did least to cause the problem are the people that are paying for it with, with their lives. And there's just no way we can look to solutions without acknowledging that at the very start and take responsibility for, for in rich countries for, for paying for some of the damage that we have caused. Okay, next one. Global warming will progressively weaken soil health and ecosystem services such as pollination, increase pressure from pests and diseases, and reduce marine animal biomass, undermining food productivity in many regions, on land and in the ocean. So this point is about the food that we eat, and it's basically saying that climate change will make it much harder for us to grow crops because our soil is going to be worse, we're going to have more pests, and we're not going to have the insects that we need to pollinate the flowers. It's also saying that we're going to get a lot fewer fish out of the sea. This is a huge problem because hundreds of millions of people depend on fish for their dietary protein. So basically it's saying there's going to be a lot less food in the future. Of course, while this is framed in terms of what we can expect, we're already seeing declines in food productivity. Wheat production in Canada last year was down 40%. Potato production in the UK um, the year before last was down something like 40% as well. So we're seeing this already. What this is saying in very, very worrying terms is that we're going to have a lot less food in the future. On mid to long-term displacement increase, which 
has a small section. It closes with these words. At higher global warming levels, impacts of weather and climate extremes, particularly drought, by increasing vulnerability, will increasingly affect violent interstate conflict. This term violent interstate conflict is a bit of a euphemism for, uh, for war. So what it's saying is as extreme weather and droughts are going to affect food security, as countries are going to, and people within countries are going to have less access to food, there's going to be conflict. People are going to be fighting over food. Mm. So climate change is going to lead to war. Complex compound and cascade risk. I think this is really, really important part of what's coming through, not just from here, but from the Chatham House report and many other places now. Here's a line. Multiple climate hazards will occur simultaneously and multiple climatic and non-climatic risks will interact, resulting in compounding overall risk and risks cascading across sectors and regions. And then it says, some responses to climate change result in new impacts and risks. That's a very long and long-winded way of saying that basically we don't have a clue as to what will happen at three degrees because ultimately the impacts of climate change are about a lot more than just the climate itself. So we know that it'll get to three degrees in a certain place by a certain time, for example. Our climate models will tell us that. What we cannot predict is how people will respond to that. We don't know if there'll be um, an authoritarian government or a cooperative government. We don't know if, if people will respond in a positive way, in a negative way. We don't know how farming will cope, for example. So ultimately, the impacts we're talking about are determined by not just the climate, but how ecosystems, how the natural world responds to the climate change, and then how the human world responds to the climate change and the change in the natural world. And because we're, we're talking about three very, very complex systems all affecting each other, ultimately, we just don't have a fucking clue how catastrophic three degrees is going to be. We just don't know. We know it's going to be mind-bendingly awful, but we don't know precisely what that's going to mean. Okay. Which is scary, which is really terrifying, because we feel, you know, when we hear the science, we, we feel that we know. We feel someone out there knows what's going to happen. But actually... We don't. We know with very high certainty that yeah, things are going to be disastrous and things are going to unravel, but we don't know how they're going to unravel. The piece here on Amazonia uses this phrase, will result in irreversible and severe losses of ecosystem services and biodiversity at two degrees global warming level and beyond. So it's saying that once we hit two degrees, which is going to, you know, happening within a few decades if, if we don't stop emitting carbon, once we hit two degrees, the Amazon rainforest um, won't be the same forest it is now. And it's, it talked about biodiversity and ecosystem services. So biodiversity is all the monkeys, all the animals, all the parrots, all the plants will not be able to live there. And ecosystem services means the things that that forest is doing for us, like producing oxygen, producing rain, producing soil, all these fantastically important things that, that keep us alive on, the, on this planet, the Amazon rainforest is not going to be doing them anymore. What it's really saying is that if we continue to heat the planet, there is going to come a point, probably somewhere close to two degrees, where the Amazon's totally fucked. Absolutely. So people are already talking about, um, in just a few decades' time, the whole Amazon rainforest just being a grassland because the, the conditions that it needs to be a rainforest just aren't going to be there anymore. The transition, the change from forest to grassland could be very, very quick. So, you know, it, it, it could be the case that you know, when you and I are, you know, a couple of decades older and we're talking to our little nephews and, and nieces, you know, we'll be talking to them about these things that used to exist, these wonderful tropical forests that there used to be on this planet, that there aren't any more. It's, it's heartbreaking. It's tragic. Mm. When you sort of read these things, you think about how stark what it's saying is about what we're doing and then look out the window and go, 
anyone? Yeah. Anyone know <laughs> Anyone doing anything? You know, it's like, I, yeah, I think it makes you feel like you're sort of mad. Anyway, here's a broad point about transition. Effective partnerships between governments, civil society and private sector organisations across scales provide infrastructure and services in ways that enhance the adaptive capacity of vulnerable people. So what they're saying there is that if we're going to minimise the damage that is caused by this, if we're going to minimise how many people suffer, then we really need everyone to pull together and work together. Businesses, the public and governments. It's specified at all scales, so that means no one is too small, no one is too big. It really needs to be every institution on the planet working together here. And this is a real problem because up to now it's not been. It's, it's you know, the public are leading this um, and a very small number of corporations, but mainly it's civil society. It's just the public and the, the businesses and the governments are dragging their heels here. We're having to really drag them along and, and convince them to take action. But this is saying they need to be taking as much action as, um, as the public is and, and really they need to show leadership. They could have just written that, couldn't they? Yeah. <laughs> Be honest. Stop pissing about everyone, <laughs> they could have said. Another piece on adaptation. The spirit of this partly is that adaptation doesn't make up for losses and damages. So it's quite clear about that. But it says, many natural systems are near the hard limits of their natural adaptation capacity and additional systems will reach limits with increasing global warming. And then further down the paragraph it says, above 1.5 degrees global warming level some ecosystem-based adaptation measures will lose their effectiveness. So when it talks about a natural system, it's saying something like a forest or a coral reef. And when it's saying they're up against the hard limits of adaptation, that means they cannot cope. So once we hit those hard limits, that's it for them. They will cease to exist. Um, and this is a real problem because we're putting a lot of faith in these ecosystems to store lots of carbon. Of course we need to stop burning fossil fuels, but we also need to reduce the amount of greenhouse gases that are already up there, so we need to soak some of them up. And that means having more forest, restoring forest, restoring coral reefs to absorb some of this carbon. But if climate change is going to kill those forests, then that sponge, that carbon sponge we're investing in, isn't going to work in the long term because while it can absorb some carbon now, it's going to get too hot and die and that carbon will be released. So this is really, really worrying because we're relying on forests to stop some of this heating. So the message is it's a vicious cycle. It really is. And that's why it is so important that we focus on decarbonising, which of course will be the, um, the focus of the next IPCC report. So I'll see you here in a couple of months to, to talk about that. But it really does highlight how important it is to get to zero carbon as quickly as we fucking can. Okay, this is a very simple point just to touch on, but it's important that it's in here and it's important to translate it. I basically want to look at the phrase, exacerbate existing inequalities. Right, so what they're saying here is that you know, we live in an unfair world, a world with a tiny number of people that are very rich and most people that are not. Climate change is going to make that much, much worse. So um, it's going to make the world more unfair and unless you're one of the tiny, tiny minority that happens to own a fossil fuel company, it's going to make you and your family poorer. Most of the stuff that's coming in the next paper is going to be about what we should be doing uh, in terms of mitigation. But here it's saying instruments that incorporate adaptation, such as policy and legal frameworks, behavioural incentives and economic instruments that address market failures, such as climate risk disclosure, inclusive and deliberative processes, strengthen adaptation actions by public and private actors. Whew, that was a complex <laughs> one. So it's saying there, if we're going to get out of this, we need to absolutely transform everything about how we govern, 
and how our economies are run, how we produce and consume stuff. We just need to transform all of it now. And the call's very strong in this paper, right, for deliberative processes, which should be heartening to anyone in Extinction Rebellion. Absolutely. See the agreement, right? So this is something that Extinction Rebellion has been saying from the, from the beginning. We've been saying this affects everyone. Our leaders have failed. Therefore, everyone has to be involved in putting the answer, in coming up with an answer together. And now the IPCC is saying absolutely the same thing. The public's voices need to be integrated into the decisions we make. Otherwise, the decisions won't be the best decisions and we won't survive this. There's also a section here about enhancing knowledge promotes a better response, which to me sounds like we need a successful XR and some to get everyone really up to speed, understanding the seriousness. So what they're getting, getting at there is that, you know, Everybody needs to be focused on this. And for everybody to be focused on this, that means that everybody has to be aware of just how much of a fucking emergency this is. And people are not because our media have failed us, our governments have failed us. People out there outside this window, do, they're just not acting like it's an emergency because they don't know how bad it is. The IPCC are saying that everyone needs to know, and you're right, I interpret it like you do, that means more people need to be raising the alarm, and that means more XR out on the streets shouting about it, so the media are forced to talk about it. Something that sits with all of that is the statement that resilient development is enabled when governments, civil society, and the private sector make inclusive development choices that prioritize risk reduction, equity, and justice. So they're saying that we need to all be working together. It's saying all our decisions that are made at any level of society have to be focused on the risk that's coming. And at the moment, people just are not doing that. We're making decisions. Businesses are making decisions. Households are making decisions based on the world we used to know, the world we've left. But that's not the world we're moving into. So we need to have this at the forefront of all our decision making, that there is a lot of risk and there's a lot of vulnerability. Um, so we need to, to make decisions that minimize damage and look after the most vulnerable. It feels also this is a sort of signpost to me anyway that like the climate movement has to be a human rights movement. Well, I, I interpret that slightly differently. I, I think much, much of the climate movement has always been rights focused. We talk about climate justice. But it's great to see the IPCC following that lead and, and, and again, recognising what the climate movement has been saying for a long time, that, that, that human rights are, are, are fundamental in all of this. Yeah. Somebody just sent me today an article. There's no mention of this in this summary for policymakers. The article is about a thing uh, called Chapter 9, which is about the impacts on Africa. It's a chapter which I haven't read I opened it earlier, it's 225 pages long. In it, it states that by 2030, which is really soon, <laughs> there could be up to 700 million people who are displaced mainly due to drought and probably food insecurity in Africa. I find that very concerning, that if we're looking at a projection that says half of the people that live on an enormous continent like that are going to find themselves in a situation which they can't sustain their, their lives where they live. Like, why is that not in the summary for policymakers? It's pretty, it's pretty important. And I imagine like if that's one piece that's from one chapter that's got one shocking article about risk in being sent to me, then presumably there's the whole report must be full of stuff like that that never, yeah, no must, one hears. Yeah, it, it just highlights just how many incredibly you know, scary things are in these full, in in the full reports that things as mind blowing as that don't make it in, in, into it. Yes, seven hundred million people displaced. Of course, those seven hundred million people have to find somewhere else to live, but all the best land already has other people living on it. So it's going to lead to, to conflict and it's going to lead to 
unimaginable levels of, of, of suffering and, and, and death and war. Just incredible that these things don't make the summary. I also um, saw um, actually a Twitter thread ab about the Africa chapter and th there were lots of things in there that I was really surprised by. So for example, the one graph I saw looked at the extent to which um, the economies of different African countries have contracted because of climate change. Every country in Africa apart from one has a smaller economy now than it did in the past because of climate change. Climate change is already making them poorer and you know 10% poorer, 20% poorer and yet in Western societies, we still talk about climate change as a future impact. It's going to impact our economy in the future. It's going to impact food security in the future. In Africa, this has been happening for decades already, and we just don't hear about that. That's a sign of our privilege in our societies, I think, that we're still able to talk about climate change as something to worry about for the future, rather than something that's already causing suffering for us now. Following on from, from the, the forced migration and um, displaced people, 11% of the global population, which is 896 million people, lived within the low elevation coastal zone in 2020. And this is going to go up. And these people, communities, face escalating compound risks and including sea level rise, especially. So the sea level rise issue means, obviously, that whilst you've got global displacement of people, like what we were just talking about, you also have an enormous domestic disruption with sea level increase, right? Yeah, and that's going to be affecting any country that has a coastline. So you know, in the UK, we're an island. Lots of people live around the coast here. London is a coastal city. There, is, um, there was an article in, in the paper last year talking about the eventual needs to relocate the capital of the UK away from London because we will not be able to defend it anymore. In 2020, there was a village in Wales that was decommissioned. I think it's called Fairbourne. The council said, we will not protect you and your property anymore. You have to leave. Um, and this is going to be happening where I live in Norfolk, where I work in Kent. People that live in coasts are going to lose their houses. Very soon they're going to find their houses uninsurable or unsellable because they, they simply can't sell them because they're threatened by climate change. And this is happening all over the world. One billion people, that's more than one in eight people, live in, are living in areas that are, are vulnerable to sea level rise. We've already talked about people, you know, 700 million Africans having to be displaced because of drought or increasing temperature. When you add all the people leaving the coasts to go inland, what we're talking about is the complete reorganization of where people live on Earth. Of course, that's going to lead to fighting as people need to find new, new places to live. It's going to lead to the loss and destruction of just hundreds of trillions of pounds worth of, of, of infrastructure. Look outside this window, we, we sit here in London Hundreds of huge buildings have been built here that are going to have to be abandoned because we cannot protect London from sea level rise. It's, it's just unimaginable how impactful things will be. This is what we have to remember when people talk about you know, reacting to climate change as being a bit disruptive or a bit expensive. Oh, we can't decarbonize, it'll be a bit of bother. There are no non-radical futures left. Either we do what needs to be done and decarbonize. And yes, it'll be expensive. Yes, it'll be a huge change. But you know, at least we'll have society at the end of it and we'll have people still alive. If we don't do that, physics is going to make these decisions for us. And you, know, you can't tell me that decarbonizing is going to be less bother than relocating London somewhere else. That's just a nonsense. Yeah, well put. <laughs> so the last line, this is what you've seen in the news. And uh, obviously you have to close the conversation with this. Any further delay in concerted anticipatory global action on adaptation and mitigation will miss a brief and rapidly closing window of opportunity to secure a livable and sustainable future for all. They have thousands and thousands of, 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 of papers, but that's all you need at the end of it. If we do not act now, we will not have a livable future. 
If we don't have a livable future, that means we have an unlivable future. That means everybody's going to be dead. It's just extraordinary to, to, to hear these things couched in this just technical language. Everybody fucking die is what that is saying. Yeah, it's like don't look up, isn't it? Everybody might just fucking die. <laughs> we have a brief and rapidly closing window to secure a livable future. And this document has been signed off by all the governments, right? So this is the most polite version of what's coming from the IPCC. Every single member government has agreed to this wording. So this is not Extinction Rebellion saying this. This is not scientists saying this. The po even the politicians, the ones that are habitually lying and pulling the wool over our eyes, even the politicians of every government in the world can agree that if we don't absolutely change absolutely everything now, then we will not have a livable future. And it's just extraordinary. A few years ago, Extinction Rebellion was saying things like this, and people were saying, you can't say that. We've got no proof. The governments of the world and the scientists of the world are saying this in plain language now. We will not have a livable future. At the beginning, like you say, it was us going around shouting, these are crimes against humanity, you know, we face cascade risk, it's worse than we thought, blah, blah. And loads of people were sort of going, oh, you can't really say it like that, that's a bit much. And the pace at which I guess the kind of like commonly used language um, in politics and in the IPCC has caught up with us, um, I think is, is actually really terrifying, but it, it almost feels on retrospect like it was easier in the old days when people was, when you were fighting against people, do you know what I mean? But there's nothing to push against anymore. Everyone's like, yeah, you're right. Yeah, that's it. But still, you know, where's the Still it carries action? on, yeah. What's really important to remember here is that this is one of three IPCC reports. And this tells us what we need to do to adapt to the impacts that were coming. But the impacts that it talked about are not definitely going to happen. They will only happen if we do nothing. If we continue in our day-to-day -day, um, activities as a society, as an economy, if we carry on burning fossil fuels. But the thing is, we have the choice. We can prevent all those impacts from happening by completely um, and very, very quickly decarbonizing our economies. And we've been saying this for years. This is not new. We know what's required. Our governments are not taking the action required. They're talking the talk, but they're not walking the walk. So, for example, you know, the UK government prides itself on being a global leader in climate action, but they've just um, given a green light to six new oil and gas fields in, in the North Sea. They're expanding airports. There's a £27 billion road building programme, which is just going to increase car dependence. Our governments are not acting like these documents are telling them they need to act. We need to communicate to our governments how important it is that they do act. We need to get them to stop listening to the fossil fuel companies and start listening to the people. The government's own polling, YouGov polling, shows that the environment and climate change is the number one concern for British people. So this is what people care about. People are terrified because they've heard reports like this and our government is not acting. So what we need to do is we all need to get out on the streets, we need to join XR, support XR and shout as loudly as we possibly can until our governments start doing what they need to do because otherwise they are failing us and we will have no future. Great. Good luck folks. <laughs>